In his latest Wall Street Journal op-ed piece, former Federal Reserve Governor Kevin Warsh writes about the relationship between economic and geopolitic, geopolitical instability. He says, massive government spending, surging debt burdens, and bank rescues over the past several years have alarmed America's allies and emboldened its adversaries. And he is calling for what he terms a new economic and security commons. Kevin Warsh joins us right now. He's currently a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Kevin, lay out what you mean uh, about this new commons. So, uh, so you gave me credit for it. George Shultz is the, is the great man who came up with that framing after World War II, and he described how the world was safer and the U.S. was safer and more prosperous because America led a new way to think about a global economy. Uh, in 2024, we can't go back. We have to look forward. But what I write about a couple of days ago is we need a new way to think about the U.S. leading the world to make ourselves safer and stronger. What does that look like? Well, it looks like a stronger economy. It looks like more, more uh, capable economic policy so that our adversaries around the world envy the U.S. economy instead of think they can intimidate it. It looks like a world that's safer because our allies can trust us and our adversaries aren't so sure what we're going to do. And even overnight, Becky, um, fishing boats between the Philippines and the Chinese, uh, the Russians uh, invading Polish airspace as part of the war in Western Ukraine. This is a world where U.S. deterrence isn't working. And what I tried to write about is that when the U.S. is no longer a force that's steady in the world, the world looks more dangerous, and that, that redounds to negative benefits here in the U.S. The economy looks really good here right now, um, surprisingly so for people who are thinking the Fed should cut rates or people worried about a recession being just around the corner. But we can't even get a budget passed over the course of 10 months. We finally have a deal that's good only until October to get us funded through October. Is that what you're talking about? Because when you start talking about how we work together and present a stronger united front. It's hard to see how we get to that point. It sounds pretty good, but hard to see how we get there when you look at Washington these days. So process matters. Um, institutions matter a lot. I'm a little less impressed about the strength of the U.S. economy today. Uh, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, for the best of intentions, I'm sure, are goosing this economy. The economy's looked great the last several quarters. It'll probably look great the next couple of quarters. But you referenced at the beginning uh, massive government deficits at times of prosperity, a Fed promising to cut rates even as asset prices are melting up, looser policy. The rest of the world, especially our allies and adversaries, look at us and maybe they're impressed by GDP growth. Maybe they're impressed by the stock market. But I wouldn't say they're overly impressed by the U.S. economic engine. The engine seems like it's being stimulated even at a time of full employment. Uh, to your point, the lead story in The Wall Street Journal today is about these surging Treasury sales um, and the money that they're going to need to continue to fund the deficits we're building up. Right. So the Treasury in the last six months, they've issued more bills, short-term bills, than they have longer-term notes and bonds. And so what happened? Long-term yields came down. So long-term yields are about 100 basis points lower than they were early last fall. And that works for a while. But ultimately, this debt has to be paid. Uh, during a time of zero interest rates for the last 10 years, most people termed out their funding. You know, the average 30-year fixed-rate mortgage out there is about 3.5%. But the only people that didn't term out their debt obligations is the U.S. government. So, that, as you say, there's a bill to pay. I guess this morning one of the issues we've been talking about is what the Fed's going to do next. Rafael Bostic now making some noise that he thinks we'll only have one Fed rate cut this year. Um, that's a long way from the six the street was anticipating at one point. Um, if you're worried about the economy, what do you think they should be doing? So well, the first thing I'd suggest is that the 19 people around the table spend more time thinking about and describing what are the factors that can affect inflation. I will say I'm a little puzzled by what their, their framework really is. We were led to believe last year that inflation was really services inflation and wage inflation. The new index they trotted out showed that 
services X housing is growing above 4%. So we haven't heard about that for a while. Listen, I am sympathetic to their challenge in trying to navigate this economy as the world is on fire. But I think pre-committing, as they do in the series of dots, each person saying how many times they'd cut three, six, nine months from now, I think it's deeply counterproductive. Now, for financial markets, it's productive. Assets prices are melting up, but they're taking big risks with inflation. So if you're, an, if you're living off your W-2 income, they're asking for inflation to move back higher, and I think some of the data suggests it is. But of course, if you have a large balance sheet, this is all a great party. Uh, but ultimately, what happens to hardworking Americans here matters more. We wait, we wait, we wait. If you were to ask yourself how long you've been worried about unsustainable debt levels, all of us, it, it probably isn't in years, it's probably measured in decades. And it scares me that we seem to be, to, to almost assume that it's not going to come home to roost. We're learning some, we're not learning lessons we should be learning because maybe of the stimulus, maybe it's being, um, you know, glossed over by, by largesse from the Fed and from fiscal authorities, but there's no free lunches. We're, we think there are free lunches now. That, I think maybe there are free lunches now, Kevin, and MMT works. We have the reserve currency of the world. We can keep spending. It's working. Biden tells us every day, it's, it's working. You've seen him say that. That's a bad lesson for us to be learning when, it, when it clearly it's not going to end well. So central bankers are paid to be nervous. So if I come on the show and I sound uncomfortable with the state of affairs, that's our job. Our job isn't to uh, uh, throw a party. Our job isn't to figure out ways to be the first central bank to cut rates into a melt up in asset prices. So if I sound concerned, I no, think that's, I'm with you. that's I'm the just, occupation. I'm just wondering, it, the, the proponents of MMT have not been dissuaded that it works yet. So in order to be persuaded out of a position, you have to be persuaded into the position. Our job as central bankers is to think about economics, not politics. Um, Long-term interest rates look like they're moving up, and government machinations to repress them worked for a long time. You know, I've got sullied my own hands in that in the 08 financial crisis. But we're at a time of full employment. The world is more skeptical of the U.S. as some shining city upon a hill. It looks to me as though they're less comfortable putting all their eggs in the American basket. So this is a window of opportunity for Washington to put its best foot forward and to try to think about some idea of fiscal sustainability and for the central bank to recognize that they played a role in that, too.